welcome to QSTP. It's uh, very nice to finally start the season and have our Technovate series back. Uh, my name is Omne Kilini. I'm the Marketing and Outreach Manager for Qatar Foundation's Research and Development. And uh, we are here tonight to kick off our QSTP Technovate series with an exciting topic. Hopefully everyone will enjoy. Um, for just a bit of housekeeping, toilets or restrooms are in these two buildings in Tech 1 and Tech 2. Um, Hopefully we don't have any uh, uh, fire alarms, but if there's anything, please go to the assembly points at the back. Uh, also, our social media hashtags for today is QSTP Technovate, Technovate, all one word, on Twitter and on Instagram. So please use those when you tweet or post about the event, and please do that and let us know your feedback as well. Uh, I will not uh, say a lot today because we've had a lot of argument about the topic, uh, should it be market-driven, market-based, customers-based, uh, but I will leave that to Meher to elaborate on today. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome Dr. Meher Hakim, Executive Director, QSTP. Um, welcome everyone. This is uh, our first Technovate for this year. Um, I think it's been five months since we did our last one, so the weather is perfect. I know a lot of you have come here for the weather and the food, but hopefully you can learn something also about QSTP and about um, why market-driven innovations are important for a knowledge-based economy. What I'd like to do is, um, I wanna start by just for five minutes, if I may, just remind you why we're here, why QSTP exists, and what our mission is within QF, and at the highest level, what QF's mission is. And then what I'll do after that is I will introduce our three speakers one by one, and they can tell you a little bit about their company and the product that they're building within their company. And then we'll sit and have you know, a discussion, two or three questions, and we'll open it to the audience. Sounds good? Wow, the animation really works. So um, what I want to do is, you know, a lot of you have been here in Qatar for a while, and a lot of you have heard probably to death the term knowledge-based economy and diversified economy. So what I wanted to do is I want to just help you put it in context. What do we mean by a knowledge-based economy or diversified economy? And what is it that it would take to get us there? And then explain what our role is within QSTP to help us get there. Um, so, question for you is, you know Qatar is a wealthy country, right? Um, how many people know how much, does, how much exports in oil and gas does Qatar have annually? And the numbers, the value. How much money does Qatar make selling oil and gas? You know, so what I wanted to do is I wanted to run a little bit of an exercise, just put, put it in context. How much money does Qatar make in oil and gas? How many citizens does Qatar have? And then translate that to what we in the private sector call revenue per employee or revenue per citizen. And these numbers, by the way, are just rough estimates because I don't know if they are 100% correct, but they should give you the idea. So today, Qatar sells, this is last year's figure, $70 billion worth of oil and gas and oil and gas derivatives are products. And Qatar has about 300,000 people. This translates roughly to about $233,000 per citizen. So we know that one day Qatar is either going to run out of oil and gas or oil and gas products are going to be cheap enough that you cannot generate $70 billion from that. So when we talk about knowledge-based economy, we're basically saying, what will be the alternative? You know, if we want to maintain the exact standards of living for our citizens today, which is roughly $233,000 of exports per citizen, how do we do that without oil and gas? And the answer has been diversification. So if you look at um, what Qatar has been doing, they already started on the path of diversification because Qatar is already establishing, establishing private sector entities, other services that have appeal globally, right? When Qatar Airways sell tickets to people for, to fly from Europe to Asia, 
and they generate revenue for the country. Oridu as a telecom company is in, I don't know how many countries, anybody from Oridu can help me? Oridu is in multiple countries and it's generating revenue through a service that are provided by a Qatar company. Al Jazeera is a media company that has a wild appeal behind Qatar market. So ultimately, it's a quest for finding industries and companies that can help Qatar generate revenue from outside Qatar that can substitute for that $70 billion number. And the question is, the question mark is, what are other companies that we can actually create in the future, now and in the future, that can help us fill that gap? that can help us create revenue that can substitute from the revenue that comes from oil and gas. And one of the answers that came out about 10, 15 years ago with the establishment of Qatar Foundation is technology, right? So if we're able in Qatar to produce private sector companies that can create tech-based products that have a global appeal, then we will be able to export these products for cash that can substitute for oil and gas, right? So all of us here in Qatar Foundation, with the education that we're working on, with the research and development, with Qatar uh, Science Technology Park, we're all looking for a mechanism to create private sector entities that one day will generate revenue to supplement the additional revenue that comes from the other diversified industries. And just to give you a, a, a context by why technology-based products are very appealing quest from the revenue perspective. Let me show you these figures. One company, Cisco, that didn't exist 30 years ago. Cisco was founded, I think, in the late 80s. So a company that didn't exist 30 years ago, today generates $50 billion in revenue, close almost as much as Qatar exports in oil and gas, Cisco has 74,000 employees. Cisco alone as one company generates $680,000 per employee, right? And how did that happen? It happened because Cisco was co-founded at a time when there is a technology trend and created a position for themselves. They became sort of the plumbing for the internet, the router for the internet. And one company that didn't exist 30 years ago today is three times richer than Qatar in terms of the revenue it generates to produce income. So in our quest in Qatar Foundation, our investment in, in education, our investment in research and technology, and investment in startups and innovation, all of these things, all we're really trying to do is find out if we can create one or two of these companies that potentially will be on an early trend of technology that one day in the future will be able to be that question mark in addition to Qatar Airways and Oridu and Al Jazeera. So the way we do that is by really building a complete ecosystem. And the ecosystem is almost like a seeding ground for potentially one of these companies to emerge. And this ecosystem consists of three different I call it the three-legged stool. You know, it contains three different elements. Education is key, right? And Qatar Foundation has done a tremendous effort in education. Not just local universities, but also some world-class universities that are on this campus or within our proximity. Education is one piece. The other piece is R&D. So our national research institutes are a part of HPKU, Qatar Foundation Research and Development, QNRP, all of the different elements that enabled Qatar to actually invest in research and science and technology development. But the one piece that we have been lacking in doing, I think, is the private sector innovation. Ultimately, the goal of all this effort is to create that next Cisco from Qatar and be able to produce revenue for Qatar to substitute for oil and gas. All we're doing here in QSTP is fulfilling that third mission. So all of our programs, all of our effort is poured into enabling and supporting the private sector to create capabilities and capacity in product development. Because without that private sector contribution and participation in building that tech-based product, 
then the education we have is going to end up with service-based jobs. There's nothing wrong with that, except service-based jobs are usually create local revenue. There's no exporting, if you will. And then a lot of the R&D we're doing is not going to see the light in the market. So QSTP is focused on the private sector innovation. All of our programs are focused on enabling the private sector to do so. And if you look at what we do in QSTP, I, the, the colors don't come out very nice. But So QSTP, we do that in three different ways. One way is that we are a free zone. A free zone basically means that anyone with an idea, any company with a product concept, can come and incorporate itself legally within Qatar without having to worry about um, a lot of the other things that you can worry about outside the free zone. The other piece is what we call the innovation center, which is really all about capacity building. So the startups incubation, the acceleration program, all the things we do for the students to complement their current education with an entrepreneurship innovation mindset. And thirdly, we have funds. So the funds that we have in QSTP are focused on creating capacity within the private sector, whether it's an existing company or new startups, to basically help create and commercialize a product. So today, the three speakers that we will have are three SMEs within Qatar. All of them are um, uh, founders and CEOs of companies who are working on bringing new products to market. They are representation of the private sector entities that we want to support and fund with the hope that one day one of them emerge to become the next Cisco and participate in creating a knowledge-based economy in Qatar. But they're also recipients to one of our funds, which we call the Product Development Fund. And the Product Development Fund is really a, what we call a matching grant. We're also subsidizing their expenses in bringing new products to market. And I'm excited to have them all on the stage. Each of them is going to come and spend five to ten minutes talking to you about their company and their story. And then we'll have them um, on stage to have a Q&A and, and a little bit of a discussion. So I need to get my iPad here so that I can make a proper... Okay, so I'm going to start with um, Mr. Abdullah al -Misnad. Um Abdullah is a co-founder and partner of Trio Investments. Trio Investments is a holding startup in Qatar focused primarily on healthcare tech. Their first product is a product called Droopy, which is a diabetes management and prevention solution. Um, Abdullah graduated from Stanford University in 2006 with a Bachelor of Engineering and Economics. I don't know how you can combine both, but more power to you. He also has a Master's in Technology and Policy from MIT. Abdullah has been involved in a number of startups before this one, and this is, I think, his third one right now and his third attempt. So with that, I'm going to just give the microphone to Abdullah to tell you a little bit about um, Treyon Investments and Drupi. Thank you. Um, so basically, I'll tell you a little bit about what we're doing. So Drupi is a digital therapeutics company. Um, so what's a digital therapeutics company? So let's start at the beginning, right? There is a problem in healthcare today for many, many reasons. Um, but when it comes to chronic diseases, there's an even bigger problem than with other diseases. So the issue with chronic diseases is that, you know, so chronic diseases like diabetes, like cardiovascular disease, um, is that basically it's not really a disease in the same way that, you know, cholera is a disease or cancer is a disease. So chronic diseases pretty much require um, require the patient to manage his own disease. And unfortunately, most healthcare systems aren't really set up to do this. So most healthcare systems, you know, you get sick, you go to the doctor, the doctor sees what's wrong with you, and he kind of, you know, proposes a solution, which may or may not work. You go try it, you come back, and, you know, he gives you another solution until at some point in time, you know, hopefully you get better. With chronic diseases, it doesn't work that way, because chronic diseases is about how do you change your own lifestyle and how do you live your everyday life in a way which actually can help you, um, you know, improve, manage, and even, you know, in, in some cases cure your chronic conditions. So um, when it comes to diabetes, um, while the patient has to live with his disease every single day and he has to treat his own disease every single day, he only gets medical support about 15 minutes every six months, right? So that's about the frequency with which 
uh, most diabetic patients can get access to some kind of clinical provider who will give them some feedback on you know, their conditions and so forth and so on. So what, what's, and this is a problem all around the world. And so what people are doing in other places is they're saying, okay, look, you know, now that everybody has a mobile phone, why can't we try to deliver the same kind of clinical resources and support to the patient while he's outside of the clinic? And so that's basically what we're trying to do um, with Druby. So uh, Druby does three things. The first thing is it provides a base clinical collaboration platform between the patient and the doctor, uh, the doctor and the broader clinical team. So what, that, what does that mean? So basically we make sure that uh, a nurse or a doctor can treat, manage, and oversee a patient's condition even when they're outside the office. Right? So it's, it's a, it's a real-time um, kind of data sharing platform. On top of that, what we're also doing is we've developed a, uh, a diabetes um, educational program. So think of diabetes like driving a car, right? So you, you, ha you can't just go, I mean, okay, some people can go pick up, drive a car and just keep, keep going, but most people need some kind of training to know how to manage driving a car. Diabetes is the same, right? So in, in the States or in other places in the world, you have these kind of 16-week programs where you go and they'll, they'll teach you all the things that you have to do to manage your own disease. Unfortunately for Arab speaking populations this doesn't exist for the most part. You know, so you know, hospitals in some parts of the Arab world um, you know, still use pork chops to show you your portion sizes. Right? So the content is, is not relevant to the people who are sitting there. Right? So doctors will tell you to go eat mashed potatoes. You know, al-batata al-mahrusa. And it's, you know, you, that doesn't, you know, that doesn't make any sense to anybody who actually with the disease in the Arab country. So the second part of our program was to actually develop content which was actually meaningful and relevant to people with the disease. And the third part of our technology is the development of a motivational platform. So we rely a lot on, you know, some of the, the learnings we have now about behavioral medicine which really, it's, we're looking at how do you deliver the message to the patient, you know, what, what language do you use, when do you say it, and, um, and, and what do you say exactly, in order to get them to actually change their behavior. And so a lot of this is based on you know, behavioral science, but it's also based on having the right human interaction at the right time, right? So getting patient access to the right coaching, the right dietitian, the right um, information, at the time when he's making the decision, right? So not in those 15 minutes every six months when he's in, in the doctor's office, but you know, about 15 minutes before lunch, for example, right? And, or you know, even better, 15 minutes before he goes shopping for groceries, for example, because it's delivering the messages at those moments that actually make, uh, that have a bigger impact on how you make your decisions, how you lead your lives, and ultimately um, your outcomes for the disease. So, and that's all really I wanted to say about Druby, and um, I look forward to the questions. Thank you, Abdullah. Thank you. You can keep it. Thank you. Um, Druby has been in business now for one, one year. You hear me? Yeah. One year old. We've been, we've been, you know, we've been working on it for a year. Yeah. We're still not in business yet. Right, but. Okay. <laughs> You've been building the product. We've been building, building the, the We've product. been spending your money. So, so this, is, this is an example of a, a new startup basically in Qatar that, that just emerged on the scene with some passionate, founder, uh, uh, passionate founders who identified an opportunity and a market need and went after that. So on the other part of the spectrum, um, our second guest is Mr. Mohamed Takriti. Mohamed is a founding partner and CEO of a company called iHorizons. I think a lot of you know uh, about iHorizons and, and Mohamed. Hamad co-founded iHorizons in 1996 in Qatar, so it's a 21-year-old company. Yeah. iHorizons, from the beginning, focused on software. So it, it's a provider of software and IT solutions in Qatar specifically, but it also has demonstrated its ability to build product and provide solutions regionally outside Qatar. Hamad himself is an expert in information technology in many fields, including knowledge management, e-business, Arab language, and media. He holds a bachelor degree uh, from Qatar University and a master's degree from the University of Texas, both as a mechanical engineer. And he was a PhD candidate in aerospace mechanical engineering. What Mohammed is gonna tell us about is iHorizons in general, but specifically the product they're focusing on today that is gonna be the content of this discussion. 
Thank you, Dr. Maher. Assalamu alaikum. Good evening. Um, so, yeah, 20 years, uh, 21 years ago, we decided to start up a business that um, the idea was to help um, companies and organizations uh, use technologies to enhance what they do. And the timing was coincidentally when the internet was starting. And we thought that internet is one of the best technologies that would drive um, innovation for businesses to enhance their effectiveness, their way to reach their customers, um, uh, the, the way uh, that um, they produce their services and products. And, and we were focused on the market in Qatar. We are a Qatari startup. Um, and of course, the startup scene in Qatar 21 years ago was very different than the startup scene uh, today. Uh, lucky you guys who are starting up today. Yeah, you are in a much better uh, situation. Um, and also, it, it, it so happened that some of our main customers today uh, were uh, starting up at that time. I can name one, Al Jazeera. And, and Al Jazeera started up about the same time we started up. And we went to them and we said, we would like to help you. You are an, a news agency. And we would like to work with you to help you um, reach with your uh, news to the whole world, not only through the satellite network that you are using, but also through the internet. And of course, the internet was new, and it needed some convincing uh, for them to invest in this. But luckily, uh, we succeeded in that. And they are a customer until today. And the main product, our flagship product, which is an Arabic news management system, was at the time developed based on Al Jazeera needs. And Al Jazeera needs have changed year after year. And our product has accordingly changed year after year. And our customer base expanded in Qatar and outside Qatar. So we claim to be one of the Qatari companies that export technologies to outside Qatar. We have customers in Europe. We have customers uh, in North Africa. We have customers in the Gulf. Um, and our strength is that we developed our product with Arabic language at the core. And at the time when Al Jazeera and, and some other uh, organizations, including some uh, Qatar government ministries and organizations, they did not find a solution that would help them um, run a, a content-based operation uh, uh, in Arabic, because uh, Arabic was not at the time supported in most of the international products. So we developed this um, special need, which is a, as per the title of the event today, it's a market-driven need. There was a need in the market for such a product. And we more or less had no choice but to develop such a product. And at the time, we didn't do any um, real business plan. We didn't do an ROI on the uh, R&D uh, for developing the product. We just needed to develop the product, and, and we developed the product. And uh, we are very proud of it. It's, it's, again, one of our products. But we, along the years, we came across uh, other market-driven uh, product needs. So one example is the Arabic search. Uh, believe it or not, very few, if any, uh, Arabic search engines exist on the market today. And there have been some early investments in the 90s by big companies like IBM. Uh, uh, but then probably at the time, it wasn't uh, a, an investment that they wanted to, uh, to take forward. Um, in our case, again, we needed to do this because our customers needed a search engine that understands Arabic um, can do um, what we call in Arabic التجريد والتجدير والبحث بالمترادفات. So basically Arabic natural language processing. And again, today our search engine uh, powers Al Jazeera, which is the largest Arabic website in the whole world. 
and it powers many, many other organizations that are driven uh, with, by Arabic content. Um, we have developed other products, uh, things like, um, with support from uh, QSTP, developed a, uh, an Arabic social media analytics platform that does sentiment analysis in Arabic. Um, and many of, it's a new product that is barely out into the market and some of our customers are experimenting with this product. And today we are just starting with a, with a, a, a product development fund um, in a new area that is relevant to our, um, uh, to our uh, current uh, market, which is um, automated customer profiling a platform. It's a platform that would hopefully in one year from today uh, be able to uh, pull in all kinds of customer uh, data, structured data, unstructured data, uh, first party data, third party data, and do some AI and, and deep learning um, and statistical analysis and then uh, uh, build uh, individual customer profiles so it's a it's a segment of one we we like to call it it's not a demographic segment of many people it's just a segment of one and then feed that into uh, targeting engines to to reach out to those customers individually with their uh, needs so it has been a very nice journey it had um, its um, ups and downs it had a lot of challenges. I'll, I'll be glad to talk about the challenges if I, if I get the time. Uh, but it's essential, it's very important that uh, if we would like to become a country that sustains its um, economy with uh, uh, knowledge-based ventures, then we believe that technology development is a very good area because it requires not much capital. There is no... Um, big infrastructure investment, it just needs to attract the right people, the right talent, put them together, come up with the right idea for a product that has a market need, and then um, go out and, and develop it, and, and hopefully uh, succeed in selling it. At the very early stages of our company, we were not a very, very good salesman. We didn't know how to sell, because we are engineers and we are technology-driven uh, people, but we have you know, learned the ropes and, and uh, how, I, I would like to think that we have become good salespeople. And, and so that's an important productization journey that we have gone through many, many times. I think is very important for the rest of the uh, businesses, the SMEs here in Qatar to learn. And, and, and we will be glad to contribute to that learning process. Thank you, Mohammed. Appreciate it. Um, how many of you use Google to do Arabic search? How many of you use Mohammed Takriti's Arabic search engine to do Arabic search? How many Chinese people do you think they use Google to do Chinese-based search? Guess? Zero. Because in China, they don't use Google. They use Baidu which is a Chinese search engine built by a Chinese company and now expanding beyond China. So one of my hopes, dreams, is for somebody here in the audience, an entrepreneur, an innovator, to come talk to Mohammed, take his Arabic search engine, go talk to QCRI, where is Mejd, license some of their Arabic-based technologies, come raise money from QSTP, and build the next Google for Arabic search engine for the Middle East. When I first came here five years ago, when we, you know, I came, many of you know that I came to teach at Carnegie Mellon University, Qatar. I was amazed by how much we celebrated that one of our students got hired by Google. Where I come from in Silicon Valley, people don't celebrate that one of their students got a job at Google. They celebrate that one of their students is actually building a company to disrupt Google. There is no reason why we cannot dream the same way. We have all the components. Here is a company that's been around for 20 years that built a product that's used by Al Jazeera to do Arabic search. Here's a whole bunch of technologies that are built in our research labs. 
Here's an organization that incubate and fund you. All we need is you. Just come take a risk and do it. And then what other country in the Middle East will be able to create the next Google in Arabic? Only a country that has all of the educational universities, all the research institutes, all the facilities, all the private sector companies that can do that. There is no other place you can do that than Qatar today. All we need is your commitment, your passion, and your willingness to do it. There are opportunities and you can pursue them. I want to do this, by the way. I can't wait to quit my job and do this. So, thank you. All right, our third speaker. Um, so we have now, Abdullah is Qatari, by the way, just in case you haven't figured that out. Um, Muhammad is what I call pseudo quasi Qatari. He was born in Qatar, but he's obviously not a Qatari citizen. And our third speaker is like me, an expat and an and import, right? Except we Sam came here four years, four years earlier than I do, than I did. So we Sam um, came to Qatar in 2008 to found his company, Informatica Qatar, which focuses on system integrations and deployment of technology solutions across multiple vertical, including aviation, sports, and hospitality. Obviously a smart entrepreneur, he picked the right industries to focus on in Qatar. And he brought with him a lot of know-how and knowledge, also from the Bay Area. So the first person I actually contacted in Qatar outside my job was Wissam. You know, a friend of us, mutual friend, put us in touch with each other. And he and his wife were gracious enough to help us um, onboard us here in Qatar, as I say. Um, Wissam spent 10 years in the Bay Area in both the high-tech industry and management consulting. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> Wissam has a Bachelor in Biomedical Engineering from Northwestern University, um, Masters in the same field from the University of California, Davis, and an MBA from University of California, Davis. So Wissam, the floor is yours. Help me welcome him, thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for that great introduction. Thanks for hosting this event. Uh, I think it's a great platform to talk about <clears throat> a little bit about what's happening outside of the construction and oil and gas industry uh, in Qatar. So as per the introduction, uh, my family and I came out here nine years ago. Uh, we sold our house in the Berkeley Hills. We sold everything and came out to Doha uh, to start basically IQ, Informatica Qatar, from, uh, from scratch. Uh, it was a steep learning curve, uh, but uh, one thing we were able to achieve here in Qatar, which I don't think we could have done anywhere else in the world, is we really worked on some amazing flagship projects here. Uh, we, we were able to work on some uh, amazing flagship projects here in Qatar, which we could not have worked on uh, anywhere in the world. We worked on uh, the airport here, which is uh, you know, one of the seven-star, five-star uh, airport. We're working, right now we're working on the FIFA stadiums. Uh, we worked on palaces. Uh, we worked on a wide uh, array of, of projects here, uh, which is a little company like us that I started, uh, we were able to grow. And I think that's one of the, the great things about, about being here. But we were service-based. So it was project by project. Uh, we brought stuff in. Uh, the only quote unquote product we had was probably our processes that we had within the organization that, w that could be packaged and exported. Uh, but beyond that, we didn't actually sh sell anything physical or, or software. Then uh, at the airport, we did a project. Uh, there's an interesting problem at airports. Uh, the air traffic control doesn't communicate with ground operations. I don't want to scare anyone. <laughs> But the operations in airports is, uh, uh, it's not as technology advanced as, as uh, other sectors as, as far as the uh, communication between the silos of, of, of the departments. So air traffic control doesn't talk with ground operations. And a lot of divisions within the airport don't communicate with each other as they should besides walkie-talkies. So the airport here had a problem and they asked us, uh, can can we come up with a solution because ground operations wants more visibility? 
So we built them a, a platform, a dashboard that basically aggregates all the information, keeps the parties happy, there's not too much sharing of information, um, and allows ground operations, visualization of what's happening, where the planes are, the, uh, the, as you know at the airport there's a, a people mover and there's weather. So we're done with the project and then they were very happy with it. And uh, internally within the company, we realized, in fact, this is a problem in a lot of airports, as simple as, as it is, uh, it's a problem. And the reason a really good solution isn't out there is because the airport industry is a niche industry and you have a few big players and the amount of innovation that happens is not as you'd see in the consumer business. So uh, one of the advantages we had is now we were experts in airports because we worked on this, this amazing airport here. And within our organization, we were debating, should we, uh, should we do this product, should we not? Should, you know, should we take it a product overseas? The cost of development here is high, you bring people in, and we were debated for about six months. And then we found out about the product development fund. And what happened there is it just helped us push, push us over the edge. Because we were willing to invest in, in making a product. But with the PDF, it gave us a little bit of uh, confidence uh, to say, okay, let's invest in the product. Uh, and, and, um, and develop something worthwhile. So we've been developing it for the six, past six, seven months. Uh, we've been invited to a few airports uh, to showcase. Most notably now, we're invited to the new airport in Istanbul, uh, which is uh, going to be the largest airport in the world with 160 million passengers. So uh, we have a proof of concept coming up with big players next quarter. Uh, and all this happened because of the of the, the PDF. Um, I have a small video clip of it, of what, what we've done so far. I just want to say, um, for the last part there, uh, you saw a table, and that's a new concept called airport collaborative decision making, or airport collaborative decision making. And uh, we had no idea that was going to be in there when we started. But when you start developing a product and you have a good team of people, uh, these ideas just, just start coming and, and you're able to build something. So uh, again, back to my point of with the PDF, it gave us that push to just start investing and, and move with the product. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. Um, so let me start by asking the following question. So we, we um, obviously in all these cases, the, the opportunity to build a product and, market, and bring it to market is driven by the market itself. So if you've identified a problem in the market, and now, whether it's an established company, a semi-new company, and a new company, you made the decision that um, you're going to make some investments in the company itself to productize something, to do R&D within the private sector, to build the product and bring it to market. And in a place like Qatar, that decision is tough because it's easier to make an investment the return of investment in other fields are much easier, much quicker. Um, so my question for you is, why are you doing it? What's the ROI? You know, and how do you measure the ROI on your investment 
And what are some of the challenges that you have faced in actually doing product development in Qatar? Maybe I'll start with you, Abdullah. I was hoping to start with uh, Osama. Um, uh, I mean, look, I think yeah, and you, it's, you, you can't look at it just as a financial ROI because um, I, I don't think you can really, you can, I mean, you can convince yourself of anything, obviously, but I don't think you can put on paper and justify that, you know, if you're in the States, you could, you could make so many arguments and say, look, you know, I'm going to IPO in five years, I'm going to do this in four years, I'm going to get, you know, $100 million from this company or that company. But I think those market dynamics, haven't, we, you know, we haven't really seen them here. So, you know, I, I can't really convince any re serious investor that, look, I'm going to IPO at $50 billion in, in 10 years from now or something like that. So I think when we look at, you know, what, what's driving us to do a product, um, versus investing in real estate or something like that. Obviously, the, it's all about the non-financial parts of it. It's about, you know, here's a really interesting problem. Here's about, you know, here's something where we think we can add a lot of value. Uh, we think we can make a big impact. So that's a big driver towards the decision to, you know, put in all this effort into a product. Now, for me, why, you know, why go to a product versus trying to do a service, um, a service approach in the same sector? And that's just really the freedom to, it's just the, the ease of the business case. So I think, you know, it's in one you're selling time and the other you're selling an output of your time. And, you know, even if the selling your time is much more, let's say, recurring or, you know, much more stable, I think for me that's a decision that everybody has to make is, you know, well, it's, you know, even if you make much less money, but at least you're not selling your time, right? You're selling a product. If I think more psychologically, you know, that, that's a much more um, fulfilling thing to do is just to sell a product and so. I, although, again, having said that, I, I think personally, I have convinced myself that, look, eventually, we think, um, we think the world is going to take notice of, of products in this part of the world. They already are. We think especially in healthcare, in the healthcare space, especially in diabetes, we're seeing a lot of companies acquiring a lot of companies outside of the States. There's a lot of you know, globalization efforts and people in California have a lot of money. So we do think there is still a story to be told financially, but I just think that it's more of a, it's more of an upside than, you know, the base plan that we keep in mind. So I, I like how you phrased it. So if you're in the service industry, you're project by project, what you're really at the end of the day is selling labor, right? You're, you're, and you're making a profitability decision based on how much you can charge for your labor versus how much the labor costs you. But when you're building a product, you're making a bet that investments in the aggregation, the collaboration of labor will contribute to an asset and that asset will have a value that you can actually generate revenue from it in the foreseeable future. Mohammed, you've done that many times over, but your company has always basically been you know, like one foot here, one foot there kind of thing. So you really, really never went do you regret that? Do you not? Do you think that at some point you wish you had spun off some division that completely focused on products and going after a product opportunity? And are you planning on doing something like this? So um, being in product development is the dream of every information technology company. Uh, companies don't typically like to be in the service business because it's as you said, it's um, more of a labor kind of um, model while developing a product has a much better economy of scale because you can sell it to many, many more customers and you can make a lot of money. And at the end, um, as a small company, um, you always hesitate because you have limited funds. and. Although I mentioned so many products that we have already developed, those have been developed across the last 21 years. So we're very, very careful, very hesitant, not to throw a lot of money in R&D and then end up with a product that doesn't sell in the, in the market. So we had to maneuver in a way that we combined the um, service model with the product model. We develop products and we use them as our Trojan horse to get into the service. Service makes good money, let's admit it, particularly if it's an ongoing business with customers that stick to you for years and years and years. 
Um, ideally, we would like to do something more focused on product development, um, but we're very cautious not to over-invest in a product that doesn't sell in the market, and at the end, we are a purely profit-driven uh, company, and although, you know, maybe personally we have ambitions to come up with this uh, next Cisco um, uh, product, but then we're accountable to our shareholders and we have to show consistent profits year after year. Uh, so we're in between the models, but I think we are uh, slowly moving towards a product-based company, more and less of a service company. The services would complement the products. So most, most product-based companies in IT expect to be in the red for a, a bit of time, right? So it's not only the investment in R&D, which is significant, but also you need probably four or five times as much investment in sales and marketing and scaling before you even turn to profitability. Um, and typically, if you're a service company that has been successfully generating profit year after year, it's very hard to convince your board and shareholders to actually flip, right? So you think you can become a product company without creating an entity separate that you can track their financial progress performance completely separately from the rest of the company? We debate this question continuously inside the company. And um, we, um, the, the best compromise we got with the shareholders is that if we can fund product R&D uh, from the service revenues, we are okay. Uh, we don't, unfortunately, the, um, the venture capital culture here is not very mature, so it's very hard to go out and, and get some venture funding for a new product that you would like to develop. So, uh, yes, it's hard to sell to the shareholders that we would like to break the working model and get into a model that has risks but may, you know, uh, shoot out of the roof. Uh, so we're still in this compromise phase, and we haven't made any major strategic decisions on whether to really spin off into a pure product company. I just want to add one thing to that, because we had the same issue. Except for us, we'd, we'd spun off a separate entity, but it wasn't based on profitability or money. It was just based on innovation, because the company IQ, which does system integration, we do large projects. One of the issues you have with innovation is you keep coming up with something and then you find something that works and it makes you money. And what happens with that is you protect it. You have salespeople, you have operations because you protect that, that, that money-making machine and you don't want it to die. Uh, so what we, and if we had kept even our team close to the, <laughs> to the, uh, to the main company, the team building Emma at the close to the main company, I think that they would have killed some of that, that innovation. So they're a completely separate entity. They do their own stuff, and it's not at all based on, uh, thanks to the PDF, you know, it's, it's supportive, but it's not at all based on, on, uh, on a P&L. But I think one of the problems you have with an established entity is to, uh, to keep that innovation going. If you get a product that's successful, great. Guys, here's an idea, take it and run with it. Uh, and that's, one of the, that's how we solve one of the, the issues we had with innovation. But, sorry, I think uh, also uh, you mentioned that companies need to be in the red for a few years. And that's culturally not very acceptable here. So culture plays a, a big difference. And, and not many people uh, understand this concept of running in the red for a number of years, and then you may or may not be successful in your product. The risk appetite, for, particularly for advanced technology concepts, if you talk about, you know, I'm, I'm developing a product in uh, social media sentiment analysis, and you may, you know, lose all your money if, if that product doesn't make it to the market. How many investors do you think will put their money on this here in, in our region? Very few, if any. We, Sam, you said that the PDF fund helped you get over the edge. So the PDF fund is 
a matching fund. It's not a, it's a grant, but QSTP doesn't give you a dime unless you commit a dime from your own company towards it. So the, the model is that if you want to build a product and you need one, one product manager and two engineers, four engineers, then you hire half of them and we'll help you hire the rest. But that still required the commitment of investments from your end, right? So that's a, as a CEO, you had to make that decision. And then you had to sell it to your shareholders. And, and then you had to build operationally the company to do that. How hard was that? I think, <clears throat> luckily, we only have two shareholders, myself and my partner. So that's one headache I don't have to deal with yet. Uh, but both of us are s sort of on the same page about new products, uh, investing, you know, we've lost money. So that's part of the game. We've also made some, some money. Uh, so, but it just, you know, you know, it's not just about hiring some people and bringing them in. It's not that easy. You need to find the right people. How do you get them into the country? How do you convince them to quit the job they're at, to leave the country, to come here? If they're not already in the country, if they're in the country, you need an NOC. There's a whole slew of problems in order to, to start the, the, the process. So the decision in our heads was, was more, I can develop the same product in Barcelona uh, for half the cost with people that are at home and, and maybe they might be more qualified or not. So if I develop a product here, it's going to cost me, you know, X plus 50%, for example. Uh, so the PDF helped us with that hurdle, really. It helped us subsidize that additional cost there is here uh, for whatever travel. You need to bring people in. Rent is, ex is expensive here. There's, there's just a series of issues you have, which is why service-based works so much better here. Because it's a service. You have a client, you say, okay, you have to do A, B, C, D. Well, here's my rate. All my costs are, are, are baked in. Having said that, uh, the money helps, of course, but I still can't bring people in. I can't bring Jordanians in. You know, I can't bring, you know, of course, Egyptians, forget it. A Lebanese, I can't bring Lebanese in. I'm Lebanese, but I have a French passport, so I'm here. If I didn't have a French passport, I wouldn't be here. So there's a whole demographic of people and talent that would love to come here, uh, but they can't for whatever reason uh, it is. So the PDF definitely helped us solve one part of it, uh, the, f the, the financial burden, but the other part about you know, bringing talent in that's still you know, t to be determined. And Abdullah, other than finance and funding, the PDF, has there been any other value? Um, because I think you have investors, so you didn't really necessarily need the funding. Um, it helped because it speeds up your development, it doubles your resources, but there, are there any other things you think being part of QSTP, being part of the Qatar Foundation community have helped you with the PDF? So I, I think the PDF was critical for exactly the same reasons that uh, Musam just mentioned, which is it's the, it's, it offsets the cost of development enough for it to be, for you to, so we could have gone many different ways. So, you know, especially when it comes to the product development part of it, it's always easy, you know, it's, it's always easier to, it's always cheaper and faster to do it somewhere else. And so, you know, you, you know, we even, we had, you know, and again, the, for us, the, 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 let's say, especially the technology part wasn't, isn't the core. The core is more the content and the, the program program part so we had a lot of decisions to think about okay you know do we hire people to develop this product or do we partner up with somebody who's already done the product and kind of jv the thing and i think it's it's these decisions where the pdf makes a difference where you say no actually look um you know even though i have to find this guy from there or this guy from there this pdf offsets some of that pain and it, it makes it right now that said we didn't actually end up hiring so we have about 15 people working full-time uh, 12 were local hires, uh, 5 went graduated from university in Qatar. So we only have, actually even of the 3 that are not based in Doha, we met one of them, one of them was working in Doha and that's how we met them. So it's only 2 people that we actually ended up you know, outsourcing if you will or hiring abroad. Um, 
So, so I do think that the financial support is a big, is a big factor in making that decision. Is a big. Uh, so just, yeah. Sorry, the broader Q, QF, QSTP, I mean, and I think just going back to some of the things that we said there, um, so we rely a lot on, and it's more the broader QF, Qatar, if you will, research strategy. So the people working with us, you know, whether it's a school, so like I said, five people graduated from Qatar, right? Um, all of them in tech field, so in computer science, all these things. Um, we have, we're working in collaboration with QCRI, who have a whole program in health informatics and health decision making. There's a whole school, you know, I think the, the Canadian school have a whole diabetes educator program. You have massive investments from the healthcare sector, so it's a bit outside QF, but massive investments from the healthcare sector in, in getting really amazing people in, on their side, on the diabetes side. And so all of these investments and all of this kind of ecosystem support was absolutely critical for us being able to find, you know, 12 people who are working in really it's cutting edge diabetes work, right? So, you know, behavioral scientists in, you know, in health. So, I mean, what were the chances of one of those just walking around, you know, around? It's the fact that, look, there's a whole machine here who's investing in this kind of research, who's investing in this kind of education, and it's, it's, that's what enabled us to find 12 people here who are interested in the subject, right? So Majid, who is this, our CEO, and he's somewhere, uh, he must be somewhere there. Um, he came to Doha because of Stars of Science. So the, his, very, you know, his very fact of him being here was again driven by an investment or an initiative by the country or by QF in, you know, in sciences or in research or in R&D. So it's, it's, you know, even though the, you know, maybe we're just getting one single stream now from QSTP, but the whole ecosystem, a lot of it was enabled by, you know, the state, if you will, or by government um, strategic initiatives. Um, just a, a, a tidbit, a little note that the product development fund that we offer at QSTP um, doesn't necessarily just cover the R&D portion of bringing a product to market. If you look at any company like Cisco, for example, if you look at their operational budget, probably 15 to 20 percent of their budget goes to engineers and scientists. The, rem the remainder, 85 percent, 80 to 85 percent, goes to product management and designers and sales and business development and, and lawyers and all of the stuff that is a required piece to be a product company. You know, when, when you buy a, a product from somebody, you expect that they have a support staff to help to support and service the product. So when you want to bring a product to market, you'll have to put together a plan that covers all of these different pieces. And when we look at the plan and we say we're funding and investing, we co-funding this product development fund, we want to make sure that you have the right product manager and you have the right marketing. And therefore, we'll also support you in, in bringing these talents and skills um, here. But I agree with you. I think you know, um, our piece that I showed before about QSTP, which is support for the private sector, I think if the other pieces of the ecosystem, if the educational universities aren't here, if the stars of science wasn't here, if the engine of creating talent and the engine of creating complementary research, including the talent in the research institute, wasn't around here, it would have been much harder to build a industry that can bring products to market. That's why I always say Qatar has the, one of the top potentials to become a hub in the region for bringing technology products to market. So I'm going to leave you with one question, and it's, it has two parts. Question is, um, what can Qatar do more for you to help you become successful and hopefully one day become the Google and the Cisco? And what can you do for Qatar to help Qatar's vision to diversify its economy and become a hub for technology product innovation? Maybe I'll start with you, Abdullah, since you're the Qatari guy. Um, so it was, so in, in terms of, yeah, so in, I think the, the, you know, the biggest benefit that we get for as a, especially as a product startup, right? So somebody who's not a service provider, who isn't interested in being a service provider, it, it's really the user adoption. So it's to say, look guys, you know, like we, you know, as a startup, we're, you know, we're very flexible in the ways we work, but you need to have a user who is open, you know, who, who will accept 
who's open-minded enough or you know who has the capacity to to really work with innovative products so you know uh, who can do who, who can you know who, who understands that what development means who understands look you know three months of you know who understands who doesn't start talking to you about Cerner integration before he starts talking to you about um, you know diabetes outcomes or what your product actually does right so this is and, and this is not just in diabetes and everything I've done in the past and even the work that we did with, with actually some of uh, I've worked before I worked with Shell and trying to commercialize some of their products here the biggest challenge was always the barriers to user adoption and, and it's not financial it's not about paying us money because that, that's never that's never the, the subject of discussion it's just about you know can you please use this product and you know if it works good and if it doesn't work then let us know that why it doesn't work and so forth and so on it's that this in first discussion this first adoption even at no cost that's the biggest challenge I think and, and if we can think of ways to get more adoption and more and it, it, to be fair it's a risk on the user side because they have to do things differently they have to you know it, it's a bit more of a headache than you know having a service provider you can yell at and shout at because at the end of the day you accept it to take this risk knowing that you know that there is a risk that you're taking and so this I think is um, what, what I think would help a lot of innovation in terms of the other side which is what we can do uh, for me it's it's you know it's the most important thing I think we can do and uh, we're a small startup so it's basically finding or not finding jobs for people but finding ways to make use of some of these outputs of the system because it's a lot of there's a lot of value here and a lot of it, it kind of gets lost in the cracks so a lot of pe a lot of you know good research a lot of good people that I think can be doing more but I think just because of you know government in general is always very um, stilted and and siloed so so as small startups we're in a good position to kind of connect people to each other and, and find a new use for them that's more valuable to everybody so I think this is uh, Next. All right. what was the question no I'm kidding so what can what more can Qatar do um, well, that's a loaded question. Or, or, so, the, one of the issues here, of course, is uh, the local population is small, but the projects are massive. So there's a lot of uh, external workforce that has to come in. So um, I don't have solutions. I'll only give you the problems. But how can we have a way to bring an external workforce in, irrespective of the, of the population that's that can be screened and qualified and brought into the country. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of stuff we'd like to do and we, we can't. So that's, I don't have an answer for that. There's so many you know, factors that affect that. Probably the, the other thing is having a good legal system in place. Uh, legal system in the sense that um, intellectual property, for example. Um, I've had, I don't know about you, but I've had clients that haven't paid for two years, three years, maybe you, 21 years. And uh, what can you do? Take them to court? It lasts four or five years. So I think a, uh, a solid legal system in, in place that's, that's very strict, that makes business owners uh, feel comfortable. The other thing is, I'm very happy here in Qatar. My, my, my family is very happy. You know, my kids and my wife love it here. We have friends. Uh, but once the work is done, I, I can't stay. Um, and that's a, that's unfortunate. Unless I have, you know, of course, my partner will, you know, uh, can keep me sp sponsored and all that. But if there's a way to give a level of comfort for people to come here and live here, there's a lot of people that, that would love to live here. Pe I don't have I have don't have anywhere else. People say, where where is home? I said Qatar. They say, where do you go for the summer? Well, I, I'm here. I don't have a plan B. This this is it. Um, so that's probably how that would, in, in, you know, uh, how Qatar can help me. How can I help drive, you know, innovation, entrepreneurship, and in, and in, uh, in, in, in Qatar? I'm starting to participate myself a lot more. Uh, I know Muhammad and I are mentors at the Accelerate program, and I think it's it's a great program. There's a lot of you know young people with great ideas, super enthusiastic, um, and how can we keep these people here in Qatar? Uh, if they have a great idea, they go on the incubator here, for example, and then let's say they go back to 
Jordan or Egypt or they go to the US or Canada or wherever, then you've just lost all that. So if, um, from my perspective, working with, uh, you know, helping drive the startup community, working with them, and then um, I have, you know, no issue keeping my company here and, and continuing to drive innovation from IQ, from, from Qatar. I think it's a great, uh, you know, um, a jumping point for the East and for the West. Um, so that's, that's my two cents. Uh, one, one of the uh, biggest challenges we face uh, in Qatar and the region is this uh, stereotype of we, as a, as a country, we don't produce technology, we consume technology. And when you go to, when you go against this stereotype and we say, you know, we have a local company that produces technology, it's not very trusted. Because everybody is, the mindset is that we get the technology uh, from the west, from the east, and maybe as a local company you can help me uh, deploy it. But I'm not used to a local company developing a technology. So one of the things that Qatar can do to help local companies is to provide, I don't want to say favoritism, but at least give local companies that have developed products a chance to compete with the big names. Thank you. Um, so, and and I, maybe Abdullah is even a, in a more difficult position. I have proven products that have worked with major organizations like Orid or like Al Jazeera, but I still find it very challenging to sell it to customers who haven't worked with me before because they say, um, you're a small company, you have developed this product, we're not very confident that we'd rather go to, I don't want to name companies, but X and Y brands, we feel more comfortable and nobody has been fired for buying from X and Y. So, so maybe some, again, not protection or favoritism, but maybe some uh, trust uh, through some legislation that gives uh, priority. I've seen this happening in the US, for example. You see tenders coming out, not even on the, on the na national level, e and not even on the state level, on the county level. If you are a company in a county, ولاية, uh, sorry, مقاطعة داخل ولاية, if you are a county within a state, you are given an advantage financially, so you, you can be 15% more expensive than out-of-county companies, and you, are, you can still be awarded this project, to, you know, other, other kind of support. Maybe, for example, if you insist to bring uh, an international company that you trust, put some minimum amount of work that has to be done by local companies by integrating my company within this big international company and that would help in a lot of knowledge transfer and then we, we localize this know-how and then after this big international leaves, you have somebody to, um, to support you here who was actually an integral part of the, of the project. So that's what we will be very helpful by Qatar. What we can give back to Qatar, the least we can do is participate in those programs where we mentor the upcoming generations, uh, help them think in terms of you know, how to face uh, the real issues in practice and how to develop products and businesses. Uh, but also our shareholders are open to investing in startups if we find, if we happen to find a uh, an interesting startup that is either incubated here at QSTP, and I had a nice tour at the incubation, and we see many promising companies, or anywhere else in Qatar, we would we would be glad to fund, support, and and help them, you know, transfer some of the knowledge we had in going through the whole uh, product lifecycle development into making it a commercial success. Thank you. Um, I know, um, how many, how, you know, anybody from the crowd from Uridu, Qatar Airways, or Al Jazeera? Do I have any, um, okay, do I have any CIOs or IT folks who work in large companies around here? 
not many. Okay, so you know, well, here's what I'm getting at is that all of these organizations, Orido, Qatar Airways, Al Jazeera, and others, they're all interested in innovations. They're all investing in innovation labs. They're all putting funding and programs so that they can do innovations. Maybe the right way for you if you are a government institution or a private sec large private sector company to contribute to the concept of innovation is to become a buyer of innovation products. Because it doesn't help if you're investing all this money in creating innovations in your lab, but then your IT department is not willing to actually buy any product that is, you know, in your case, Al Jazeera was a big help for you. So obviously they've done something right to enable you. Absolutely. Um, but it's, it's the point that came out here with the, with the sort of early adopter market is, is, is not just in Qatar, by the way. So um, I, I built a number of startups in San Francisco. And then my last startup, I moved an hour north of San Francisco to Sonoma County and I started a company there. And the mindset of the potential customers an hour north of San Francisco in San Francisco is a night and day. So basically, and there's a reason for that, because the people who live in the Silicon Valley and end up working in banks, and they're all our risk takers. So the culture of the Bay Area is a culture of early adoption of early technologies, and it's an easy way for them to jump and get excited about it until it's mature enough that other companies and other you know, um, regions can buy from it. And that's unique about the Silicon Valley. It's unique even, you know, if you go an hour north in California, or east or south, you cannot find that. But I think we have an, an opportunity here in Qatar because everybody is in, interested in that to do exactly what Mohammed and Abdullah and Hussein were talking about, which is figure out a way for um, the companies to get involved in product innovation by encouraging startups with innovative products to be their first customers or their test or their pilot customers and so forth. So um, why don't we open it up to the audience with some questions? Um, and then, do we have microphones? So we'll take one, two, three, four, and then we'll go beyond that. Okay, uh, shall I stand? Okay. Yes. I'm sorry, I missed most of the talk actually, and I'm very uh, and eager to to ask a very critical question. Uh, I'm Mohammed Al-Muhannadi, I'm the CEO of a company called Social Media Solutions, which is a service-based business, uh, focusing on, uh, and as well, I'm a marketing mentor in the accelerator program, um, supporting uh, uh, companies and startups into, uh, in their marketing approach. Um, I've been noticing in the last Kitcom, uh, and a formation of uh, the community uh, uh, the innovation community, which uh, not yet been highlighted in, in many areas, and a lot of, uh, as, I, as you said, large uh, private uh, companies and governmental companies have been working together to create this kind of uh, innovation community. So, um, and I asked the question of what is the integration model between uh, startups, innovators, and how can we integrate with those companies, the 19 organizations, big organizations, who have been involved in this press conference? And how can we take it forward from there? How can we push for it as, as uh, entrepreneurs, as uh, somebody who's willing to, to support? And as well, I will say that social media solutions are willing to support from consultation perspective, from services perspective, into developing the right innovative community. Thank you very much. Um. That's a question, huh? To me. Yes. I'll be very honest with you. We have not leveraged the innovation community yet because we haven't figured out specifically what is it the thing that we can ask of them to do that have material impact at the end of the day. And I think with this discussion, I just found one. You know, I think one, thing, one way to activate that innovation committee is to get every member to commit to buying a product or piloting a product from a startup company that is involved in, in our innovation ecosystem. You know, and that will be a way to actually test the water to say whether or not they're really interested in helping and incorporating innovation or just interested in the you know, photo op. So we'll, uh, we'll follow up on that. I think you just connected two dots for me. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Hafzi. I just graduated from Qatar University of Policy Planning and Development. And after I graduated, uh, I think that I'm really interested in, in entrepreneurship. 
So I have one specific question for Mr. Muhammad and one general question for the three speakers. So the first question is for Mr. Muhammad. Uh, Dr. Maher said that uh, it's um, any uh, passionate entrepreneurs who want to uh, work as a high eye horizon to make it uh, an Arabic uh, search engine. Uh, I want to know more about the, how, how does this will work. And uh, that second question for me as an entrepreneur, uh, I, I don't think myself I'm an entrepreneur. I just graduated and I'm willing to know anything about entrepreneurship. Um, all the entrepreneurship here in Qatar, I see the most yani, things I see all in, in social media is only food, uh, uh, coffee shops, and uh, clothes. So for, for me, I want an idea like uh, what, yani, for you entrepreneurs, what, what can, uh, an idea that I can um, make it yani, as a, a project that will help the Qatar vision or uh, the Qatar uh, life. Yeah, thank you. Hamad, are you willing to license your engine to somebody who wants to create a consumer-facing search engine? Yes, absolutely. That's your answer. But of course, the challenge, uh, we have thought a lot about, see, our, just to simplify the technicalities, our search engine is what we call an enterprise search engine, which means it can help People. So when, when uh, Dr. Maher said how many people used our search engine, nobody raised his hand or her hand. But if you have ever used Al Jazeera website, Al Jazeera.net, the Arabic uh, uh, website for Al Jazeera, and if you have ever searched for any articles in Al Jazeera, you have used our search engine. But we don't have a Google-like um, search portal um, to, for you to go and search on iHorizon search engine versus a Google search engine. So the jump is basically, it's not a technological jump as much as it is of a, uh, an investment jump in actually marketing a search engine that everybody will use. That requires, of course, yeah, we need to enhance the uh, scalability and the responsiveness, etc. but that's very doable. However, you can throw out a public search engine for years and years, and many people have done it have done it in Arabic, but it never succeeded because it didn't catch on because it was not properly funded marketing. Many people underestimate how much you need to invest in order to take this product and make it a public search engine. You probably need in the tune of $50 million to create an Arabic search engine today, but nobody's gonna give you $50 million today. What you need to do is go talk to him, talk to QCRI, understand the technology, understand what the market is, come up with some idea, and go to an investor and say, if you give me half a million dollars tomorrow, I will get from point A to point B, and then I will raise more money to take it to the next step, with the goal of becoming the Google of the search engine. That's how I will do it, if I want to do it. Nobody is going to hand you 50, the required investment to become a Google. But there are a lot of investors who are willing to, with the right person, with the right commitment, to give you some money to take the first step that allows you to actually show some progress towards a milestone that allows you to raise more money and then raise more money. You know, Google didn't become Google by getting $100 million from, poop, from people. It became Google for getting $100,000 first and then talking to Stanford to license the technology from it and then putting it out on the market. One more here and then we go. Okay, Dr. Maher, thank you. Let me disagree with you for, uh, to start with uh, this talk. You just mentioned that those Fortune 100, which you named, few of them are interested in innovation. Uh, I totally disagree with you. They are just interested in operation and operational revenues. And if they are uh, interested in innovation, we should uh, see them around us. Their innovation manager, innovation executive sitting next to you on such an important topic and trying to be part of the ecosystem of innovation. This is really one of them most challenging aspects in, in Qatar. Innovation, especially digital innovation, is still out of context in the nationwide uh, arena. My direct question for my previous post, I had the pleasure to work with Muhammad 20 years back. Muhammad had, or I Horizon, had a content management system 20 years back. And in that, at that ages, there was a big product called Vignette, an I Horizon knowledge server. Did Muhammad manage or did iHorizons intended to sell out to, uh, through an exit for uh, any investors or any big uh, technology companies? Because one of the, um, uh, the, the, one of the 
uh, ways to get a benefit of the product is to sell it out for a bigger uh, technology firm that can sell it out all over, all over the world. Thank you. So um, one thing we succeeded in is not selling a product, but selling a share of our equity. So we sold 51% of our equity to a local investment firm here in Qatar a few years ago. And I think that's by many measures a success. Um, we didn't exit the company completely, but we, we sold a majority, a, a small majority stake in, in the company. Um, and that's a, a, it's a nice deal to have and it's a nice thing for everybody to get a chance to, you know, to, uh, to sell equity in the company as a reward for the efforts of, of decades. Uh, we try to communicate with some uh, product um, owners or product companies to see if they have any interest in, uh, uh, in, in looking at our products and maybe acquiring them. But um, people, again, don't expect to see um, products coming out of this region, out of this part of the world, and, and, and being sold to a US-based or a Western-based company. So we didn't find much interest in, in, in what we have done. But uh, I mean, for this product, that you mentioned specifically, I think it's a leading product now in, in Arabic content management. This is the one that currently powers Al Jazeera and many other media organizations. And we are gradually turning it into a news management uh, solution as a, surface, as a service platform where we would like to do a Arab-wide drive to have as many news agencies adopted as possible. Thank you for this uh, very interesting uh, presentation by the team here. Uh, I have a question. Um, we are looking for possible causes for um, why we're not doing better as an ecosystem in producing tech companies. Is it possible that also a contributing factor is the people in charge of this ecosystem um, are trying to impose a model on Qatar that doesn't work in Qatar. For example, people who think that in order to start a business in Qatar, commercialize some technology developed in Qatar, we need to get people from Silicon Valley to Qatar to do it, instead of trusting, trusting the local entrepreneurs. And when they actually deal with local entrepreneurs, they do it for politically correct reasons, not you know, for show business, rather than genuinely because they believe in their ability. Should we change the people who are in charge of the ecosystem and actually get some people who really trust the local entrepreneurs and respect the capabilities of these people to solve local problems before they actually jump into the international arena and, you know, and become like a, a showcase for Qatar, do you think? I don't know why you say that. Everyone I've worked with has been local here, all the entrepreneurs. I haven't seen anyone from Silicon Valley here. In fact, the only person I know is, is Matter, actually. Uh, and everyone, I've, I think it's, it's great because I work with people from only actually Arab countries or uh, Far Eastern here, and they're bringing a completely different uh, perspective. They're bringing a different perspective to entrepreneurship. The only thing I say, I would say is, what's being put into place are models that have worked uh, in, other, in other countries where there is entrepreneurship. And I think uh, the, one of the reasons that is, is, as you very rightly said, is you know, failure is seen as a bad thing, whereas in Silicon Valley, failure is seen as a great success. You fail and, and they, they, give you more, they give you more money, actually. The point is to, to fail quickly. But for me, I, I've worked with, lo when I say local, both local as in Qatari, but, but regional also uh, that I've dealt with. So I, I haven't seen that model uh, in play, actually. I think um, what you meant is probably that um, uh, in many organizations, people who are decision makers don't yet understand the importance of supporting local innovation. And I think this is, we don't need to change them. They are, 
gradually changing two ways that are, you know, people are changing their mentalities and plus new generations are coming into the picture with more awareness of the importance of supporting local innovation. So it's happening, it's happening slowly, but it's happening and I think that's a normal change if you, you know, a change in, in society doesn't come uh, quick. Thanks. Uh, my name is uh, Anwar and uh, I'm one of the co-founders for a platform that we've started here. It's, uh, it's called Snappy Clicks. It's a platform to um, it's on demand photographers, Uber for photographers. Um, and we've just started it, just launched about a month ago here, doing quite well. Um, I've got a question for Abdullah and one for you. Um, I guess it's a joint conjoined question. Um, we're at a stage where we've got the platform ready and we're looking for further development of it and we're contemplating whether to do the development in-house or outsource it to someone. And we'll, most of the feedback that we've got is, you know, you should have a team in-house so that you're not, uh, you know, squeezed by the development teams, etc. So that's what um, the question for Abdullah is that should I really have a team in-house or should I be, you know, outsourcing it to another development company or a software house or something like that. And I guess a related question to that is that for a startup like myself, um, finance is a, is a major consideration and I think you guys have probably underplayed it a little bit because you guys have access to finance, but for startups that's a major consideration. And one of the things for PDF, if you're saying that you know it's 50%, does it really still bring the cost of development down substantially so that you're competitive if I have three people working here, two for the further development and maintenance of the site, two people for development of the app, will I be competitive than going offshore to Ukraine or to India or somewhere like that and getting it developed there? Um, does, it, does it really make it competitive? And if I was to make that, and we were actually talking about having the development done here, uh, but the major consideration would be, would it bring the cost of development after the 50% funding commercially viable? That's the question. So I think to answer your first question is it depends. It depends on lots of things and I think it's a, it's a much more detailed discussion that we'd have to have for me to answer that question. I, I, most likely you'd want some in-house in general but again it depends where you are in terms of a product. I mean if you're very early you may say look I just want something that I want to prototype and see if it works and if it works then I'm gonna hire my own in-house team. So it, it depends on lots of factors. Did the finance make a decision affect the location of my development team? No, it didn't affect the location of my development team, but it effect, what it changed for me was whether to develop a certain product or to JV or to partner up with somebody who had already developed that product. So it's a bit of a different discussion and, and for sure that, and again, it's also related to the nature of my product. So there's other people who, are, who have similar products to what I'm doing, but focused on different geographies. So there's, there's a lot of opportunities for partnership and so forth. But the, for me, definitely that co-funding uh, really helped drive my decision, or our, our team's decision, to our own development of the product. Um, but the location is still a, is a secondary factor, right? So it's still, you, yeah, and even within the PDF, the, you, there's some flexibility about where the geography is uh, of, of the team is. Um, oh boy, it's going to be a long, it, it requires a long answer, but let me try to summarize it. So I just met, um, last week actually, we met a, a, a two brothers who launched a company called At Home Doc. At Home Doc, something like that, here in Doha. They were doing the exact same thing, Uber for doctors. We have in QSTP, in addition to the product development fund, we have another fund we call the Tech Venture Fund. And the Tech Venture Fund is an investment in a startup company. So if you come and you have a startup that you're building something, you're working towards a market, we will invest in you. But we will never invest in an idea, somebody who's saying, I have an idea, I want to build a product, Let me g give me money to build a product. Because that's not the right way to build a tech startup. What these two brothers have is a number of things that's going for them. First of all, the two co-founders, two brothers, one of them is a doctor, one of them is an engineer. So check, the founding team actually complement each other. They actually spent the past year and a half working to register a licensed clinic here in Doha so that they can operate as a clinic. They hired two doctors. 
they didn't build the product. They put a website and they marketed it as a, you know, on-demand doctors if you give them a call. While they were with me in the meeting, the guy received two phone calls for an order. They demonstrate their ability, this is what we call the market-driven innovation, is your ability to actually, in, a, in a parallel to building your product, to demonstrate that you understand your market, you understand what needs to actually happen to build your market and execute on it. This is very interesting for us to invest in because it's not, they're not coming to basically say, I want to build a product. They're coming to raise money so that they, can, they say, I want to get to 1,000 orders a day. And that's attraction. Um, so our tech venture fund is meant to invest in tech startup companies who the founding team needs some money so that they can actually quit their full-time job or do something, but they have to demonstrate their ability to actually execute beyond product development. Um, and if part of that is toward the product development, that's great. Whether or not you want to do all the product development here or offshoring, even when I lived in the Silicon Valley, four out of my five startup companies, the majority of our product development was on offshore. One time we started, we had a Russian team. The other time we had a Jordanian team. A third time we had a Romanian team. And the fourth time we had a team in Michigan. So we do not require that all the resources to be in the physical location. However, the product management aspect of the product, the key system development of the product, has to be as close as possible to your early market so that you can actually iterate very quickly. And then you can offshore a lot of the things that, that you want to offshore development on. Good evening, my name is Katrin Schultzbart, um, and thank you very much uh, for this event tonight, um, especially to see the variety of different uh, companies from startup to more of a mature company. Um, I was impressed, especially um, Abdullah, for you to say that uh, you're in the game for an impact-based uh, organization to really have create something that has a larger impact, and, and as you could see from all other all three organizations, it's really about your uh, determination to um, create that impact in the region itself and then beyond. Um, it kind of reminds me of the very first uh, Technovate event where you said um, we need to create a innovation culture and uh, tonight we were talking more about the in the uh, parts of the ecosystem. Um, but with reference to the one of the previous questions is um, are we imposing a model that's not really working for the region? It's more like, um, is the region itself not, not even trusting itself and looking for those um, outs outside um, uh, impact? And, uh, and so I was, maybe if you could briefly talk about collaboration within the country itself, the region itself, because everybody talks about collaboration, um, but when it comes to action, it's very often, more often, turf battle rather than uh, collaboration. Uh, and I would be interested to hear uh, what your experience is with information sharing uh, between different companies and not necessarily uh, your own um, technology-based companies, but uh, with a more broader uh, base of customers and potential um, uh, yeah, uh, co potential collaborators that um, that uh, broaden your spectrum, uh, but may or may not trust you or um, local-based uh, organizations to work together. Thank you. Can I, let me, um, since this came out twice, I think I want to address a point. Um, you know, it, it, there's something unique about the Silicon Valley that exists here in Qatar as well, which is diversity. Right? So Silicon Valley today, 90% of people who live in San Francisco are not from San Francisco. The majority of them are foreigners, but there are also people from New York, from Chicago, from other places. Innovation without diversity doesn't happen. Right? So if you go to any, I mean, I'll, you're from Germany. I, you, know, you, you understand Berlin today is where innovation is happening because Berlin opened its door to people from all kinds of places and disciplines and all of these things. And other places like Stuttgart and Hamburg are stagnant. They're doing more of the sustaining innovation. They improve on what they have. So a key ingredient to enable innovation is that diversity. And we have that in Qatar, right? So we need to figure out a way to maintain it and encourage more of it. Because I think without that, so the model that we're really importing from the Silicon Valley is that the encouragement of experimentation and diversity. There's nothing else. I, I think it's interesting this came up twice, actually. 
And I think, so within like my company, so I'm an engineer. So within my company, we started to grow. And I had to hire a finance person. Well, I have no idea about finance. So I'd interview people and I'd hire the person I thought it was right. Uh, the point is, I mean, I hired a lot of the wrong people until I got it right. In the same sense here, there's, there's, um, there's a capital and there's, uh, there's money to develop something. But the people that have the money doesn't necessarily know how to diversify and how to hire exactly the right person at the right time. And it's not within the country, or else they were developed it 50 years ago. So in the beginning, you have to look outside and bring, and bring it into the country. Uh, maybe someone gets sent out and educated and brought in, but, but this takes time. But to say that, you know, oh, it, it's, it's not easy just to say, well, let's, let's do it in-house. I think your point about collaboration is, 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 very, is very correct. So this knowledge is brought from the outside in here. I think the bigger question, uh, as you rightly said, is how do you integrate it and make it part uh, and sort of, of gel with it? So for example, I keep people talk about you know, London or, or Silicon Valley. How do you take the best of that and bring it in here to make it the, the, best, of, the best of here? But I think there is, there is an issue with, with doing it uh, the right way. So I, I think that, you know, we, again, we've talked about the model, the innovation model. So I, I mean, the point that I want to say, and maybe it's related to diversity, is that there are a lot of people within the Qatari ecosystem, within the local ecosystem, who are tremendous champions of innovation in all levels of government and all government organizations. So my first job after I graduated in 2006 was to come work in Doha on a research on a joint research project it was actually a product development project between Stanford University and what's now Manatak where the engineer in charge who was a 60 year old Egyptian guy actually reached out to Stanford to develop a he wanted to develop a what was a, basically a cutting-edge multi-dimensional modeling product that he said look I, I really want you guys to come over here and develop this product for us here in Qatar. So we developed it and we, we applied it to some of the DR projects. And I'm, 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 I don't know what happened to it now. But the point is, you know, if, you know, there has always been champions of innovation. The challenge is to, and, you know, is to kind of support these champions and you know, not let them get defeated by the anti-champions of innovation who also exist, right? It's, you know, you have, it's not that nobody cares about this. No, you have people that care very much about innovation. But you also have people that very much want to block innovation. And it's just this balance of, of you know, who wins in the battle, right? And so it's not, you know, and so the model is there, the people are there, people understand it, people get it. It's just about tipping the balance so that, you know, we actually get some of these, you know, get greater acceptance or get greater. I think, you know, Desira is a good example of an organization that does accept a lot of innovation, right? across the board, so not just, you know, the whole, their procurement, the whole team understands what that's about. So, you know, I, I really, dis you know, this, we aren't importing anything here. There, there are people that are thirsty, that are actually reaching out and trying to find people that will support them. And it's just about kind of pushing on that, that element. Um, let me, uh, we're going to finish it up soon, but let me finish with one story to share with you. Um, last week, I was at WISE conference, which is the, what does WISE stand for? World Innovation Summit for Education. And I met a lady from Iceland. Um, it's probably the first only Icelandese, Icelander, who come to Doha. And at this, you know, last week also was the soccer game between, for those of you who follow soccer, between Qatar and Iceland. Iceland's soccer team made it to the World Cup this year. Italy and the Netherlands, who are world champions, did not make it. So Iceland, a tiny country of 300,000 people, are now world champions, and they made it to the World Cup. And I was talking to her about, about the Iceland soccer team, and what we shared, she shared with me, she said the following. This didn't happen coincidentally. This started in Iceland 20 years ago. 20 years ago, Iceland as a country came together and said, we want to become world champions in soccer. Not sure why but they put their minds into it. And what happened next is that the government started investing 
in <coughs> indoor stadiums, because in Iceland it's very cold, you cannot play soccer outside. So they've invested in a lot of indoor st stadiums. Parents started telling their kids and, and targeting them towards soccer as, as a sport. Universities were created and programs were created to teach soccer coaches to become better coaches. And they send them around the world to become good coaches who came back and started educating the younger people the proper way to play soccer. 20 years later, Iceland had a team in the World Cup. Things don't happen overnight. Results of the effort that you see here that places like Kara Foundation started about 10 years ago, it will require time to make it. And in the process, a lot of people are going to make mistakes. We're going to you know, take a two steps forward, one step backwards. But at the end of the day, we have to understand that this is a long-term game. And if we want to become an ecosystem that can create the next Cisco from here, which I think not only it's an important thing for Qatar, it's really an important thing for the whole region. When was the last time you saw a big tech companies come from our region? You know, the last time we contributed in technology to the world and science was a thousand years ago. So it's about time to actually do something like that. And I really feel that the, the, the grounds and the pieces that Qatar and Qatar Foundation are putting in place have a potential of getting us one day. You know, is it guaranteed? Absolutely not. But without it, nothing will happen. So with that, I would like to um, thank our guests. So please give them a round of applause. I would like to thank you for showing up um, and staying that long and allowing us to go over time. And I'd like to thank um, my marketing team and our operations team for doing all the hard work of putting, this doesn't happen easily, by the way, so thank you all.